Previously, we looked at several examples of late 16th century European patronage, from Philip II in Spain to the Medici Dukes of Tuscany and Elizabeth I in England. This time, for the final chapter of the season, we'll zoom out to evaluate the bigger picture of what's happening across Europe around the year 1600, beginning north of the Alps in the Low Countries, France, and the Holy Roman Empire, and then moving back south to witness the dawn of the Italian Baroque. In the 1560s, Northern Europe experienced an assault on religious artwork known as Bildenstorm, culminating in the public destruction of religious artwork in Antwerp by Protestant mobs. This wave of iconoclasm spurred continued interest in genre painting and innovation in secular subjects. Now, genre painting isn't limited to Bruegel's landscape peasant scenes, and it also doesn't necessarily mean that there is no religion altogether. A very highly revolutionary subject was the open-air market scene. Peter Artson's marketplaces, including this meat stall, paved the way for still life painting in the 17th century Dutch Golden Age. Here we see pork, cow, fowl, and sausage depicted with photographic realism. But if you look closely, you can see the Holy Family giving alms in the background. Mary is offering bread to a poor boy. But the biblical scene here has just been relegated to the far background, it's barely visible. So this type of scene would have still been commissioned and viewed by a religious audience. Um, and that means that although they may seem completely secular, oftentimes there is religious iconography hidden somewhere. There is also a moral message here that arts and hints at at the sign and the top right, which reads, Behind here are 154 plots of land for sale immediately, either by the rod or plot according to your convenience, or all at once. So we have a choice of buying it, of getting that material property all at once, or in discrete chunks, just as how we have a choice of buying this entire stall of all kinds of meat in all in one go, or just according to what we need. So Artson is inviting us to think once again about what we value, what we need versus what we desire. And I invite you to think about that too as we view lots of very expensive decorative arts in this chapter. The scene of almsgiving in the background, of course, is related to the idea of giving to the poor. So in that sense, the entire painting is a commentary on gluttony and greed. It's metaphorically persuading us to choose frugality and generosity over gluttony and greed, tying a religious scene into this very ostensibly secular one, and in a very clever and groundbreaking way. The market scene would enjoy new favor in the Dutch Republic, established in 1581 when the Netherlands declared independence from the Habsburg dynasty, the Holy Roman Empire. With the port city of Amsterdam newly flourishing from trade and an influx of Protestant craftsmen, the new nation experienced its golden age beginning in the late 16th century and blossoming in the 17th. Dutch Golden Age art is predominantly secular, 
But the early Netherlandish approach to painting, the attention to detail and desire to mirror nature is retained. Another continuity through the ages. Indeed, the market scene is the precursor to the Dutch still life. In France, the prosperity of the first school of Fontainebleau that Rosso Fiorentino had helped to establish at the beginning of the 16th century was interrupted by a nearly four decade long religious war between Catholics and French Protestants known as Huguenots. France would remain Catholic, however, as the Huguenot leadership was brutally massacred under the highly strategic and fierce queen regent Catherine de' Medici, a Medici who married into the French royal family. So it wasn't until the rise of a new monarch, Henry IV, or Henri IV, that patronage resumed and the school reformed, this time as the second school of Fontainebleau, members of whom continued adopting a characteristically mannerist vocabulary. Many of its members are anonymous today, like the artist of this strange double portrait of Henri's mistress, Gabrielle Destre, whose nipple is being pinched by one of her sisters. And the rendering of the fingers here already betrays the mannerist tendencies of the Fontainebleau school. Three of them appear to simply sprout out of this rather plump hand. Um, the lady's skins are completely pale with very little anatomical modeling and exaggerated smoothness. It's the antithesis of early mannerist muscularity. It's almost reminiscent of Bronzino's allegory for François Premier, and it speaks to the evolution of mannerism into a style that focuses chiefly on exaggerating beauty, whatever that beauty is perceived to be. Here, it's pale, smooth skin. The subject is startling and incredibly unusual. There's a sense of mannerist theatricality with the curtains in the foreground being drawn open on both sides to reveal these two nude women in a bathtub. And in fact, we can actually see the water level in the bathtub. It feels almost unnecessarily dramatic, as if this is some sort of stage but the background is unassuming. There's just an older woman sewing next to a fireplace. And that almost reminds of the Venetian theme of the reclining Venus, where there's an unabashedly naked Venus, almost inviting you to enter the scene while normal activities resume in the background. But while this iconography is superficially erotic, there is a deeper level of meaning. We see Gabrielle holding a ring in her left hand, which, together with the emphasis on the nipple and, by extension, lactation, may point to her recent pregnancy with Henri Katz's illegitimate child. So it's a beautiful, if slightly bizarre, representative of late 16th century French painting. 17th century French artists would join the more classical Baroque movement, which we'll look at toward the end of the chapter. We've seen several times now that competition among European powers involved cultural and intellectual competition with showing off courtly splendor, as well as political and military competition, especially with the Age of Discovery on the seas. That was the deal with Elizabeth's Armada portrait. But imperialism and colonialism also brought to the courts of Europe a new curiosity, not just for exotic objects, but for unexpected or surprising artifacts in general. Unexpected in the sense that they'd never been seen before. Some sort of new technological advancement, perhaps. Value became tied to the exotic and the unexpected, to weird and wonderful objects that were collected by those who could afford to buy and commission them. And they were often assembled in cabinets of wonder, literal cabinets of curiosities like this one. In German, Kunstkammern or Wunderkammern. One of the most famous and diverse Wunderkammern belonged to the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, 
with his court initially at Vienna and later at Prague. And Rudolf had quite the penchant for, I, th I think, unusual and idiosyncratic arts and artifacts. And before we look at the decorative arts, I want to trace the arrival of mannerism at Rudolf's court through the invitation of artists working in an Italian mannerist idiom, just had François Premier had done in France. Giuseppe Archimboldo was a Milanese artist who took everything about mannerism to its absolute furthest extremes, with both dramatic exaggeration and symbolic sophistication. He's celebrated for a series of marvelous portraits, such as this abstract librarian literally built of books and bookmarks. After a brief stint at the Viennese court, Archimboldo moved to Prague, where he completed his best works. Here, Rudolf himself is shown, but not as a person. He's a collection of many fruits, vegetables, and plants. He's a personification of Vertumnus, the Roman god of the seasons and of flora. But this wasn't just a portrait designed to entertain. The variety of foods that constitute Rudolf's body imply the empire's expansive territories and broad influence. And even though they're quite crowded, they form quite the harmonious ensemble. Archimboldo manages, I think, to achieve a delicate balance between the contrasting shades of red and green, when such a densely packed composition can easily become confusing to the eye. You are challenged to name all the foods present in this portrait. The variety of gourds alone is impressive. Rudolph has wheat for hair, apples for cheeks. There are plums, cherries, several varieties of grapes, uh, cabbages, onions, peas, red currant. I see a plum, a fig, and an artichoke on his left shoulder. Each individual component is actually incredibly realistic. His ear is made of an ear of corn, which would have been imported from the Americas, from the New World, and that alone demonstrates the cosmopolitan and commercial nature of Rudolf's empire. Vertumnus here is embodying the bountiful harvest and all the wealth and prosperity associated with a bountiful harvest. He is just the master of artistic hyperbole. And I think most people know Archimboldo from a series of four portraits made for the Holy Roman Emperor, representing the four seasons, showing personifications of each season literally composed of their archetypal characteristics. Spring is a lady in full bloom, a study in plant identification, And that contrast between the warm pinks, reds, and yellows on the face, and the collar of white daisies, and the myriad shades of green on the body, and the surrounding darkness is just marvelous. It's just delightful. The lips are roses, and if you look closely enough, even the teeth are delicately rendered lilies of the valley. It's all painted with an astounding exactitude. From the chest of each person stems a flower or fruit representative of their season, and in spring, the species that gets this spotlight is the iris, which blooms late in the season. Summer, on the other hand, evokes the image of a golden wheat field with ripening fruit. Archimboldo has actually signed and dated the work, carefully weaving them into the straw clothes of the sitter. We see a peach on the cheek, cherries and pears, garlic, uh, an eggplant, radish, squashes, plums, 
and a thistle sprouting from the chest. With autumn comes the successful harvest with a palette of oranges and yellows. He's made of apples, a pomegranate, a mushroom for an ear, a pumpkin, and so many grapes. And he's clothed in a barrel wrapped with cut stems. We can see olives just peeking through the wooden planks at the bottom right. The highlighted plant in this painting is a fruit that was very commonly consumed during medieval and renaissance times, harvested toward the end of the fall season, but very little known today. It's almost unheard of. It's a medlar, a sweet fruit with a very characteristic shape. And it was known for its medicinal properties, too. In fact, if you look closely at one of the unicorn tapestries, the one of the unicorn purifying water, you can just see a medlar tree to the left of the fountain. And now, winter has arrived as a dry, dead, and seemingly uprooted tree trunk. Very few leaves remain, but growing rather bravely from the base of his neck is a branch with a lemon and an orange, which are both wintertime fruits. A pair of fungi have called this rotting log their home, and they're now the mouth of the figure. His eye is a crack in the wood. It may seem that these optical illusions serve only to amuse, but they do serve a powerful propagandistic function too. They daringly illustrate the Holy Roman Empire's access to all kinds of wonderful international goods and its full dominance over every aspect of nature itself. So now let's look at some of the curiosities in Wunderkammern, cabinets of curiosities, including the celestial globe that we saw when we discussed Holbein's ambassadors. And this belonged to Emperor Rudolf II. It already tells you a lot about the nature of the most sought after collectibles. They were splendid, often made of precious metals, including gold or silver gilding and often associated with scientific or practical purposes, just with a very luxurious twist, to the point where they look as if they're purely decorative, although many retained practical functionality. This is a time period where science and pseudoscience are regularly interacting, almost overlapping, in fields like medicine, astrology, and alchemy. There's even an alley in Prague Castle, officially known as the Golden Lane, but colloquially called the Alchemist's Lane. And although alchemists never really lived here, it speaks to the popularity of alchemical practice in Prague under Rudolf. Alchemists at this point were trying to make gold out of metals like lead, a transmutation process they called chrysopoeia. And part of it involved seeking the philosopher's stone, which was capable of enabling this transmutation um, and was also considered an elixir of immortality. And this here is an actual medieval alchemy lab underground in Prague. Well, Rudolf is rumored to have owned at one point, and we know his personal physician definitely owned it at one point, the Voynich Manuscript, a codex written in a language that's yet to be deciphered. It's one of the great mysteries of European history. It dates to the 15th century, and within its over a hundred folios or leaves, um, it contains a fascinating array of flora and fauna, some real and some fake. But some are quite faithful to the real plant. This is turmeric. You can see where the author is getting these illustrations. It's not just all made up. Um, but we have no idea what the text is saying, so we don't know if they're describing herbal uses of these plants or just providing a botanical description. Some of them are pretty easily recognizable. 
This is an artichoke thistle or cardoon. There are also astrological and astronomical illustrations with the zodiac and the constellations, again. There are sections devoted to medicine. This is a folio, two folios on balneology, which is the treatment of disease by bathing. And you can see that curious script again, filling the page that nobody can read. But all of these nude women are engaged in all sorts of strange activities. These are folios 75 verso and recto. That means that the image on the left is actually the right page of the book. And you flip that page over, you get 75 recto or 75 reverse. And that is the image you see here on the right. Very compelling illustrations, and actually the liquid in which they're sitting is flowing down to another pond where there's another group of women there. Now, some of the plants have to do with herbology, with preparing herbal potions. So it may be that these are recipes. You can see here that this folio is actually folding. So here it's been extended. The entire manuscript has been released by the Yale Beinecke Library where it's preserved. And I encourage you to look through its leaves and give it a go at interpretation. Wartime cryptographers have even failed at trying to decipher the Voynich cheese code. This interest in the occult was not a quirk of Rudolph's. It was shared by many scientists, so-called, and mathematicians of the period. Astrology and alchemy and herbology were some of the most prominent scientific fields of the Renaissance. John Dee was employed by Elizabeth I as her court astronomer, um, and indeed, scientific advancements in astronomy and mathematics and such became a point of competition among royal courts. And interestingly, Dee might have been the one to sell the Voynich manuscript to Rudolf in the first place. But I'm showing here another occult object with which John Dee is associated, his so-called magic mirror. It's actually an obsidian mirror, made by the Aztec people of the Americas. Obsidian is a very sharp material, it's a volcanic glass that was used to make spears and weaponry there. And the Aztec civilization was ruthlessly conquered by Spanish forces under Hernan Cortes, both through physical force and the introduction of smallpox. And this mirror was brought to Europe as one of the spoils of imperialism and fell into Dee's possession. Now, Aztec priests were known to use these sort of mirrors to summon visions of spirits, and Dee did the same. But for his sorceress research, he conducted research, so-called, into the occult, and he performed seances using it to communicate with the spirits, and to see one of those, you should watch a horror film. Rudolf also had a particular interest in astrology, hence his collection of celestial globes, and it ended up spurring advancements in the related scientific counterpart, astronomy. Tycho Brahe was employed at the court as the imperial court astronomer. He was given the opportunity to build a new observatory, and there his assistant was none other than Johannes Kepler, uh, known for his laws of planetary motion, published just after 1600. And together, Brahe and Kepler would conduct the astronomical research published in the Rudolphine Tables, named, of course, after Rudolf II, a catalog of stars with calculations of planetary locations. And Kepler's official title was Imperial Mathematician, Except that just meant that he was like the head astrologist. He gave astrological advice based on interpretations of the stars to the emperor. Rudolf and other nobles in the Holy Roman Empire were fascinated by automata, automated machines that prefigured modern robotics. 
after being wound up, this mechanical galleon or ship would have literally sprung to life. It would have moved on wheels. Um, trumpets would be blared. Cannons would be fired. Music would be played. The figures on the ship are electors, just like Frederick the Wise, who had the privilege to select the Holy Roman Emperor, and here they're surrounding Rudolf II, who's enthroned. Many of the artists specializing in automaton production were smiths and clockmakers, as was the case with Hans Schlottheim, the maker of this marvel, which we think was owned initially by the, one of the electors of Saxony at the time. Nobles were competing to have automata in their Kunstkammern. So there was some serious science and also serious pseudoscience going on in the Holy Roman Empire, especially Prague, toward the end of the 16th century. This goblet is an example of an object valued for its rarity. Narwhals were, of course, exotic animals, very rare sights, and their horns were particularly valued due to their resemblance to the legendary unicorn horn, which was believed to have miraculous healing and protective properties. So this goblet would have not only been a very luxurious decorative objet d'art, but also a talisman. Perhaps less familiar to a modern audience is this bezoar, which was believed to have all sorts of magical healing properties, an alleged remedy against all types of poisoning. A bezoar is a stone formed in the digestive system of an animal, in this case a goat, from indigestible material. Yes, humans can get bezoars from eating tons of persimmons. No, they are not an effective antidote. Well, why did they even need so many antidotes? Not because they were poisoning themselves partially, but the explanation for many diseases was poisoning, quote-unquote, even if it wasn't. So... Any sort of antidote like the bezoar was highly, highly valued. And here it's crowned. It's mounted on three gold lions adorned by emeralds. It's very opulent, if a bit bizarre looking. Lions were actually brought in uh, to Prod Castle, where they were allowed to roam the grounds freely. Attacks apparently did occur. Rudolf had a penchant for exotic animals. So the decorations on this bezoar would have pleased him greatly. This is a standing chalice with a most singular construction. It's a cup for drinking water. And it's the shell of a chambered nautilus, a marine mollusk found in, in this case, from the waters east of China. And that gives you an idea of the complexity of the provenance or the origin of these materials and objects. This nautilus shell features carvings, very delicately carved decorations of, chi of uh, dragons. And we think that this was done in China, in Southeast China. These are recorded as being Cantonese productions. So how did it end up in European collectors' cabinets? Well, the reach of the Portuguese trading post empire was extremely expansive in the 16th century. There had been a Portuguese merchant establishment in Macau in southeast China today, which is in fact a Portuguese territory until 1999. And merchants were known to export all sorts of goods, ranging from common spices to extremely prized rarities, such as these decorative nautilus shells to the west. We think that this particular shell ended up in Padua because the support of the cup is an eagle's claw with very exquisitely gilded talons. Those seem to be signature of Padua metalworking workshops of the 16th century. It's been confirmed with similar artifacts like this inkwell and candlestick in one from Cleveland. And in fact, this object shares the same iconography as the Nautilus shell. If you look at the decorative structure of the Nautilus support, you'll find that half of the shell is encased by the form of a sea serpent, 
from whose mouth you're seemingly drinking when you're using this cup. And on the back of the beast sits the infant Hercules. And curiously, in the Cleveland object, we also see the infant Hercules. And this is from a tale wherein a very young Hercules strangles two snakes. If you look very closely, you'll see that on the Nautilus, Hercules is actually holding a snake in his left hand. This is classical imagery that seems to have been regularly used by Paduan workshops as stock material that satisfied the erudite tastes of learned patrons. And it makes sense that this occurs in Padua, which is, a, which is very well known at this time for its university and its classical humanist scholarship. It's a fascinating object with a fascinating history. Just as the Nautilus shell was uh, brought to Europe by Portuguese explorers uh, from Asia, many other curiosities were brought from Africa and the Americas. They're the legacies and spoils of imperialism. And traders and merchants then attempted to make a market out of them, for example, by promoting their purported medicinal properties. And that brings with it the story of colonialism and the subjugation of native peoples all around the world. The interactions between native populations and imperialist nations are reflected in the artwork of the period, not in the documentary artwork, but in the evolving styles of native peoples. This ivory salt cellar was created in modern-day Sierra Leone by a sapi carver, probably for European patrons by way of Portuguese traders who greatly admired West African ivory sculpture. On the base of this ivory structure, we see four crouching dogs face to face with four hanging snakes. According to Sapi tradition, dogs are able to see spirits that we can't see. The impact of the Portuguese arrival on the West African coast is more evident in this ivory salt cellar from the Benin court in modern-day Nigeria. And salt cellars were very popular goods because salt itself was a, a pretty expensive spice and you would have wanted an equally uh, luxurious status symbol of an object to house it. On the sides of this salt cellar, we see two wealthy Portuguese men and their attendants. The one seen here holds a spear and a sword, wearing a necklace with a cross and a doublet, which has this long pleated extension toward the bottom that resembles a skirt. And we can tell from the stress that he would have been quite wealthy, probably one of the traders. It's illustrative of the artistic legacy of imperialism and colonialism. We began this season by looking at Italy, particularly Florence, the cradle of the Renaissance, as it were. And through the centuries, we've seen many a shift in the centers of culture and patronage. Florence rose to peak prominence in the Quattrocento, only to be overshadowed by papal patronage in Rome during the High Renaissance. Venice, the east-west commercial nexus of the Italian peninsula, would rival Rome in a competition of sorts between Colore and Disegno, which, as it turned out, were not mutually exclusive. With Raphael's death, the new Medici duchy in Florence spurred a new era of mannerist patronage that sought to transcend the grand manner and the classical perfection of the High Renaissance, while Venetian masters adopted mannerist methods but stayed faithful to their training as colorists. As the Cinquecento drew to an end, the artistic atmosphere in Italy was quite different than those at other European courts because of counter-reformation forces that called for more dignified, more serious works of religious art. 
After all, one of the major Protestant dissatisfactions with the conduct of the Catholic Church was the commissioning of grand and opulent religious buildings and artworks, most prominently the St. Peter's Basilica, and this was a target of counter-reformation reforms. So the Baroque style, which is really a continuation of the Renaissance, an artistic evolution rather than a revolution, is emblematic of the Counter-Reformation. The artistic vocabulary became even more theatrical, even more dramatic, centered around achieving maximum visual impact. That didn't mean that patrons couldn't commission very opulent, non-religious works for private viewing, like mythologies. It just meant that artists were now living in an environment that valued and increasingly prioritized didactic religious art. To trace the origins of the Baroque style, we have to travel to Venice and Rome. The leading Venetian painter after both Titian and Veronese died was Jacopo Tintoretto. And initially, Tintoretto's style is quite similar to the former two artists, but his late style becomes almost unrecognizable in comparison. This is Tintoretto's Last Supper from the 1560s, and this is the same subject from the 1590s. It's dark, dramatic, almost anxious, we see an artistic trajectory that almost mirrors Raphael's transformation toward the end of his life with the Transfiguration. We're in a tavern lit only by fire and the halos of these holy figures. The angels are wisps of smoke floating above. The reason that this type of art became popular is that Counter-Reformation officials were delighted with it. This was a no-nonsense depiction of a biblical narrative, while the unorthodox perspective and arresting contrasts of color demanded the viewer's full attention and, by extension, devotion. It was encouraging piety, and that was the whole goal of the Counter-Reformation, to promote Catholic piety. The drama in this painting, then, serves its religious function. So this is one type of painting that prevailed in the Baroque. Darkness and drama commanded attention, and religious paintings that commanded attention were celebrated during the Counter-Reformation in Catholic areas like on the Italian and Iberian peninsulas. So the use of contrast to produce a sense of dramatic theatricality became firmly ingrained into the Baroque artistic vocabulary. This nocturnal landscape is only 30 by 40 centimeters. It's a cabinet painting made directly for a collector's cabinet, a Kunstkammer. And it's painted on copper, which is a much smoother surface than both canvas and panel. Panel was already much smoother than the coarse surface of canvas, and artists often preferred smooth surfaces because it allowed them to express their own textures. They weren't limited to the rough feel of canvas. And it also allowed for much greater detail. Here we see the flight of Mary, Joseph, and the Christ child into Egypt to escape Roman persecution. The only sources of illumination here are the fire, Joseph's torch, the full moon and its reflection in the water, and the myriad of stars in the night sky. It's the Milky Way, which was then seen as the path to heaven. Superficially, there's a feeling of serenity and calm. There's no noise, the water is still, the trees are still. But there's also a sense of foreboding, of anxiety. What now? What will happen next? It's a haunting and apprehensive scene. 
And it's the work of Adam Elsheimer, a German artist who traveled to Venice and later Rome to witness Baroque developments in both cities, like Dürer did now a century earlier. And Elsheimer has certainly mastered the Baroque vocabulary, deriving the contrasts, for example, from Tintoretto. What the church didn't want to return to was mannerism, the twisted and voluptuous nudes, those elongated and exaggerated forms were deemed incompatible with dignified religious spaces. But some artists continued deriving inspiration from mannerism nonetheless, and they tried to find ways to make it work in a counter-reformation context. It's most evident in the work of Domenico's Theotokopoulos called The Greek, or El Greco, a painter from Crete who moved to Toledo in Spain, a city that he depicts here in this landscape, by way of Venice, where he would have seen the work of Tintoretto. El Greco prefigured expressionism and modern art at large with a style that none of his peers was really able to understand. It doesn't fit anywhere really in the narrative. I mean, this is by no means a serene landscape. It's like nothing we've seen before. It's full of gloom and anxiety. The sky near Toledo is almost pitch black. And to understand this, we really have to backtrack to understand how El Greco even got here. Well, he started off as a budding young painter studying in Venice, the island of Crete having been a Venetian territory at one point. And he didn't exactly get off to the best start, as we'll see. But we already see a fusion of golden Byzantine elements and these dramatic mannerist forms in this early triptych. He then went to Rome. He was quite pleased by the likes of Parmigianino and his Parmese colleagues like Correggio. But he was very displeased by Michelangelo. He even suggested that he should be called upon to repaint The Last Judgment. Now, all of those people were dead, El Greco was only looking at their work. He gives off the impression that he barges into the city and begins evaluating all of these words of art critically, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it certainly wasn't particularly appreciated by the Roman artists of the time. So he's not well received in Rome, and in search of work, he strategically moves out of Italy into a place where there is great demand for the arts. And in this, at this time, it would have been Spain, the capital of which is Toledo. Titian, Philip II's artist of preference, had died, and Sofonisba and Guisola had returned to Italy. And so Philip was in need of court artists. Well, El Greco seized the opportunity, and he was indeed welcomed to Toledo, completing this altarpiece for one of the monasteries there. Yes, there was definitely work and a demand for art, but he wouldn't achieve his ultimate goal of gaining royal patronage, because for whatever reason, King Philip II didn't like his work. He essentially got rejected. And it's compelling to think that the reason for El Greco's rejection from the court was that his style was simply not in keeping with, with, with counter-reformation ideals. It was so different, and that wasn't necessarily a good thing, it wasn't necessarily celebrated in a time when reforms were going on to promote purity and decency in art. But El Greco would still stay in Toledo, at least he could lead a stable life there, and the demand for artists still remained. And it's in this context that he paints this landscape, uh, this view of the city. It's difficult to characterize El Greco's inspiration and thought process. On the one hand, he has his Byzantine roots, but on the other hand, he's taking what he wants from the Venetian masters, from the Roman masters, from the Spanish masters, 
and he transforms all of those styles into something centuries ahead of his time. He's Greek at heart, he's always signed his name, Domenikos Theotokopoulos. He considered, and I quote, the imitation of color to be the greatest difficulty of art. So there he's agreeing with the Venetians uh, on the importance, the primacy of color above line and design. But he's a bit of a paradox in the way that he, he rejects Michelangelo's art while adopting certain elements of it. The Laocoon is somewhat inspired by the Roman Laocoon group, the same source of inspiration for many other artists. But El Greco distorts it into a deeply unsettling image. It shows Laocoon and his sons being killed by Athena's snakes after trying to expose the Trojan horse plot. The bodily elongation and disregard for proportion is absolutely in keeping with mannerism. Except El Greco is working in the 1610s when nobody really other than him, is still actively trying to play with mannerist elements, not in the sense of the intellectual sophistication that you still found at some other European courts, but in the sense of the stark exaggeration and elongation with Parmigianino and Pantormo in the mid-16th century. So, again, he's a bit of a confounding variable in tracing Baroque origins, and it's not accurate to credit him with influencing later Baroque artists because his work simply wasn't appreciated during his time. He's a bit of an anomaly, and I think a very intriguing painter in a turbulent religious atmosphere in changing times that simply couldn't accommodate his style. So let's now move to Rome, where the Basilica of Santa Maria del Popolo houses the most spectacular juxtaposition of early Baroque painting there. At the center is Annibale Caracci's altarpiece of the Assumption of the Virgin, her ascension into heaven, almost a condensed version, a more crowded version of Titian's Assunta. We see a mix of Titian in the approach to lighting and Michelangelo in the approach to figure to create drama. Annibale Caracci was from Bologna but worked in Rome, and he synthesizes the grand manner of the Roman High Renaissance with the brilliance of Venetian color. He leaves out all of the mannerist distortion in continuation of the High Renaissance tradition. This is another example of Caracci's work. Again, there's a wonderful mix of many prior styles. There's a Venetian landscape with a Roman temple. So this is the classical revival side of the Baroque, exemplified by Annibale Caracci and his brothers. Now back in the chapel, on the side walls, we see a very different face of Baroque art. These are two canvases by Caravaggio, the other great pioneer of the Roman Baroque, whose fame now completely overshadows that of the Caracci. I think most people now know Santa Maria del Popolo for these two great paintings. In one, we see St. Peter being crucified, and immediately before even noticing the subject of Caravaggio's composition, we note the lighting in the picture. It's not completely dark as in the Tintoretto, but it's certainly not as bright as the Caracci. It looks spotlit by a very strong source of illumination shining in from out of frame. And this is an extreme chiaroscuro that we call tenebroso. 
And it's this for which Caravaggio is so well known today. The conversion of St. Paul on the opposite wall is a remarkable picture, not only because it demonstrates that signature tenebroso once more, but also because it reflects the promotion of conversion images during the Counter-Reformation. St. Paul converted to Christianity after experiencing a divine vision en route to Damascus, where he was supposed to arrest all the Christians, and we see that image here, where he's lying on the ground below a horse led by an elderly man, having been blinded by the divine light of heaven in his vision. And Caravaggio illustrates that light shining in from the upper right. Caravaggio's portraits employ the same tenebristic technique. Early on, it's milder, like in this early self-portrait as Bacchus, the god of wine. The contrasts are less violent, and aside from the intense interest in producing a sense of drama, we see an interest in naturalism. Look at the precision with which each fruit is rendered, the soft and subtle interplay of light and shadow, on his body. But those light effects would become progressively stronger and progressively more dramatic. This is Narcissus, who fell in love with his own reflection, according to mythology, upon seeing it in water. It's a circular composition, directing our eyes to and fro uh, between the real Narcissus and his mirror image. Carvaggio is such a virtuoso, his warts are so eye-catching. He often used common people as his models, even for holy figures. The softness of that raking light on Narcissus's face, the gleaming highlights on the cheek, knee, and hair, the sharply contrasting shadows, the textures of the robes, Caravaggio became quite influential in Baroque Roman circles, um, but he was quite a violent and capricious person. He was often on the run for crimes, defamation, harassment, brawling. He was sued numerous times for failing to pay rent and then attempting to attack his landlady. He threw a plate of artichokes at a waiter. He physically assaulted people. The intensity and disturbing imagery in his work sometimes reflected his own violent tendencies. Like in this shield showing the head of Medusa who has snakes for hair and a gaze that could turn anybody to stone. And this was a diplomatic gift commissioned by Cardinal Maria del Monte who was his most important patron in Rome for the Medici Duke of Tuscany, hence why it's now in the Uffizi. Often Caravaggio was jailed and then escaped from jail with the backdoor help of powerful patrons like the Cardinal. Things got really bad after Caravaggio murdered a man, either because he lost a tennis match or lost a woman, a prostitute, to the victim. Well, unfortunately, that man was actually a well-to-do noble whose grieving family pursued litigation against him. And it was out of the Cardinal's hands this time. Caravaggio needed a pardon. He had been sentenced to death uh, by beheading. So he fled from Rome to city after city on the Italian peninsula, and severed heads began to appear in his work, a reflection of his own fear and dread. Look at the tension and the drama in this work. Judith, 
with her tense eyes, her furrowed brows, sliding the sword through the neck of Holofernes, who is still alive, his eyes wide open, his mouth agape, we can hear him screaming, his blood gushing out. The old woman on the right stares directly at him, a towel ready to take care of the bloody aftermath. Look at the way the light is violently shining in from the upper left, illuminating those red curtains, the robes, the skin, the catch lights in the eyes. It's impeccable. Here, the head of St. John the Baptist is Caravaggio's own. He begins to include his own face on the severed heads of people in his works. He sent this painting to a nobleman whom he hoped could help him grant a pardon for the murder as proof of his repentance. Caravaggio really became increasingly desperate, unpredictable, less stable in the mind, more and more violent, known to carry a sword at all times and even sleep with it. He sent another painting of David with the head of Goliath, his own head once again, to another cardinal in Rome, again in hopes of securing a pardon. And this one was actually close to working. Just as he was about to return to Rome, finally having nearly achieved his goal of getting the pardon by the cardinal who's very pleased with his work, he died. He was 38. Under unclear circumstances, we still don't know exactly why or how. But what's clear is that Caravaggio exerted an incredible impact on 17th century Italian painting, especially in Rome and Naples, the two cities in which he stayed the most. His followers were named the Caravaggisti, and they would flourish in the 17th century, not only in Italy, but also in the Dutch Republic. And it's safe to say that when we think of the Italian Baroque, one of the first artists whose name pops up is Caravaggio. So the drama of the Baroque develops out of the application of prior styles to a new religious environment. It's building upon high Renaissance ideals and abandoning largely the exaggeration of mannerism to create irresistibly striking and emotional works, sometimes dark and violent, as with Caravaggio, other times a nostalgic return to the classical revival and the glory of the early 16th century, as with Annibale Carracci. And in this sense, the Baroque is not a rejection but a continuation of Renaissance and Reformation. I want to extend my thanks and appreciation to you for completing season one of A Narrative Art History of the Renaissance in its entirety. Thank you for following along on this journey through the century of art, and I hope you've now seen that art history is truly so much more than a collection of facts and rote memorization. Instead, the history of art has everything to do with society, politics and economics, cultural norms and evolving tastes, patronage, religion, self-expression and self-consciousness, everything that makes us human. Art, and by extension self-expression, is what makes us who we are as a people. 
Art weaves each culture's story, individuality, and philosophy into the global tapestry. And in that sense, each individual artwork is like a thread, connected to every other artwork by an intricate, interconnected, interdependent system of threads. The ideation and creation of that cultural meaning constitutes the artist's end of their contract, and the receiving end is us, the viewers, and the cross-cultural emotional connection that we experience as a result. And the study of those connections and the context behind them is art history. The universality of the arts promotes unity among societies, even when international relations are strained, when the strength of our delicate global tapestry is challenged. And that time is now. And the diversity of the arts encourages the expression and appreciation of culture's unique identities and legacies, each of which contribute to the richness and nuance of the tapestry. And we should cherish that now more than ever. Art is really, I think, an anchor of reference in that it allows us to empathize and develop mutual and yet independent understandings. We desperately need that now. And art really offers solace to anybody who's willing to open their minds and accept that offer. Art, through its myriad media and unlimited possibilities, allows humanity to further its quest for knowledge, to present the true nature of humankind, to present rage alongside reason, irrationality alongside judgment, flaw alongside beauty. Art is an exploration of the human condition. The beauty of every brushstroke, every thread, every perfection and imperfection on canvas, panel, copper, marble, and paper, it all enables us to communicate and empathize as a collective humanity. It spins the virtues and vices of our species into its own tapestry, one shared and studied by all of humanity. The hunger for knowledge and pursuit of happiness and contemplation of the meaning of life itself are all likewise woven into this complex, vibrant picture. Its meaning carries well beyond the canvas and the marble, transcending boundaries of geography, language, and culture. Art reaches every corner of the globe, influencing and creating, guiding and teaching, telling the human story.